Hey buddies, this is the program National Security Strategy on Radio Star with Anna Shafran. Today we have Oleg Grigoriev, a doctor of biological sciences, a member of the RAS Council Bureau on Radio Biology, and the chairman of the National Committee on Near Protection. Hey Oleg, how's everything? Hey Anna. This subject involving non-ionizing radiation and its effects on living organisms, which we encounter on a daily basis, has become an integral part of our everyday existence. All of these inquiries generate a great deal of lively interest. Essentially, in theory, globally, and we alongside you in a recent show uncovered a fascinating fact, which is as follows. The entire progressive section of humanity is looking forward with hope and anticipation at Russia. What is your understanding? What I am referring to is the actual study of the topic of bio-effects resulting from electromagnetic radiation and the effects it has on human beings. And as for Europe, the USA and all that jazz, these fancy pants scientists and interested folks, they appreciate the stuff that's going on in Russia, the Russian Federation, mm -hmm. as the heirs of the Soviet Union. And this is a very important context in which I would like to discuss a variety of important topics that are of great significance. One of them, and the first one, will be the following. Yesterday, at the National Academy of Sciences in the United States, some American scientist researcher named Alex Pentland, who is a pioneer in using network science to understand changes in real human behavior, gave a lecture. This is what is referred to as how AI can assist in predicting human behavior and expediting the resolution of social problems, particularly those that have garnered significant attention, especially yeah. since the year 2020, when the matter of social engineering emerged as a prominent concern. Artificial intelligence, large language models, as it turns out, can aid in integrating human behavior into forecasting models to enhance attention and response to a wide range of phenomena. And here we already have something very familiar and close that we frequently come across in our daily lives. Climate change, pandemics, and income inequality. Yep. An ingenious way of expressing it. Let's discuss it. What the heck is this lecture and what is the whole deal with everything that is happening right now? Certainly, without a doubt. If you take a step back from these lofty declared goals and tasks in simple and clear terms, it is fundamentally a question of effectively managing through the intricate and interconnected mechanisms of reverse biological and psychophysiological feedback. So, we're discussing a significant number of individuals. I mean, we're definitely not discussing individual management, but rather collective management, because individual responses can differ. You have the option to completely ignore like a red light, let's say, on your smartphone. But it is important to note that the majority of people will react and abide by the traffic rules in place. And the main task of this group, which he established at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, is to learn how to use psychophysiological and physical beacons that are embedded in programs. These programs are further embedded in visual information display tools, sound accompaniment, and electromagnetic accompaniment of devices like smartphones, computers, tablets, and more. The group aims to acquire knowledge on utilizing these beacons for enhanced user experiences and interaction with technology. What is the user interface? So, to direct human behavior and control it through feedback using factors, elements, and mechanisms. The user interface plays a crucial role in guiding users, providing them with a means to interact with a system or device, and shaping their actions based on information and cues. And the thing is, the task is set up in such a way that the management is carried out not just individually, individually less interested, that is, Vasya Petrov stands up, leaves the chair, and walks directly to the bathroom without any detours. Yeah, that's not particularly interesting. What's interesting is the behavior of certain groups, certain masses, Feedback is controlled by two channels. One way, that is precisely through behavioral reactions, that is the responses observed in actions, the actions they performed, their reactions, and it is under direct control as a result of the responses, signals they receive through the software, hardware means that are already integrated into these devices right from the beginning. So there is feedback incorporated in there. What is artificial intelligence utilized for? Artificial intelligence is needed to process. Can this be called artificial intelligence? I don't know. This is a job dealing with large amounts of data. 
This job involving big data is required to be customized individually for each of these, and the individuals in this group are actively involved in it. Besides this lecture he gave, they have published several articles, all of them leading American universities. In addition to Stanford, there is also a laboratory situated there, and they are conducting experiments in controlled conditions on large groups of individuals, providing them with different tasks to perform. And the description provided in the article accurately reflects their ultimate aim and primary objective. How individuals will make decisions regarding the trajectory of collective behavior while being influenced by the physical and psychophysiological factors at play which they acquire through their interactions with devices and the working process. So, right from the start, I can tell you that, of course, this is not a major scientific breakthrough or anything, you know. It is more or less just something they understand in laboratories, specifically in the field of biological feedback clinics, and it is not considered groundbreaking in the broader scientific community. The subsequent element, which is noteworthy and already incorporated in the 5-6G communication standards, is direct biological communication. Therefore, when this narrative reaches its conclusion, in addition to the aforementioned device they possess, which enables responses to the signals that occur, there are also distinct signals occurring individually. They'll have to monitor, you know, like they'll get to control physical reactions, a direct response, not like they shouldn't, but they'll get the chance. And the entire concept is specifically about avoiding being overly conspicuous to an individual, such as, like what American scientists state, in order for the person to retain their sense of free will, freedom of action, that is to say, he believes he made his own independent decision. In actuality, this is a situation that is managed collectively. I will emphasize it once again for clarity. Geared towards mass behavior, towards groups of individuals, that is to say, for example, I am uncertain whether they have the capacity to manage an audience of one million, that is to say. So right now we're talking about up to 100 people. Specifically, they're experimenting with up to 100 people in groups of 25, 50 people, 75, up to 100 people they're experimenting with these folks. Well, it's an experiment, a real idea of continuous education, which again is tied to digitization, which... Once again, I'll mention this diagram with the scheme that we've shown multiple times, how the education system develops, including devices, systems, standards, software. And here we go once again with the closing, that is, how can we technically and technologically implement this binding mandatory delivery as we have done in the past? So, like, it's one thing if you want to use it privately, Go ahead. If you don't want to use it, that's fine too. But if there's a thesis of continuous education that is provided by digital means, you will have to be tied to these devices. You will have to be tied to the software. You will have to be tied to the feedback system. Yeah, science fiction is an incredible idea, you know. Education is a vital part of the human community, present in every state. From a young age, every citizen is involved in this education system, making it an essential aspect of society. And if the thesis of the continuity of education is declared, that is, throughout their entire life, or rather a person is obliged to somehow improve their qualifications, that is, Approximately 5 to 10, he will be integrated into this system in the event that education is digitized. Here it is, the main key thesis. So, like, to say that a person shouldn't learn, shouldn't educate themselves throughout their entire life, that's just plain stupid because, so, if education is digitized, it's a completely different situation, a completely different background, and a completely different outcome. This is not about education, it's not about education, but about managing collective mass behavior, not even consciousness, but behavior. And here is another quote I would like to bring from the lecture we've already discussed. We always have these constant issues where we don't know what to do. Inequality, actions to change climate, and so on and so forth. And many of these things depend not on technologies or systems we design, but on human behavior. Once more, we must regulate human behavior yet again. Yes, and in order to achieve that, they are suggesting a pathway through continuous digital education. How, I wonder, does the little box open? 
Yeah, but if it were theoretically, you could just relax because they are university professors after all. You could simply reside and observe the next discussion, the next idea. Uh, but once again, I will return to those drawings, those diagrams of progress that we have talked about many times, because we know, we know what the technology of promoting the standard is from the standard. That's all, all this story they talk about. It's quite fast. And there is already a standard project dedicated specifically to the ideological conceptual component of software for digital education in schools. That is what should be included there, how it should be organized. That is the norm. These are the standards of the International Electrotechnical Commission Subcommittee on Education, which once again were projected through IEEE through the Committee of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers in the United States of America, where it is located. And so gradually, through technical committees in which the country participates, they simply participate without any ulterior motive, by the way, they pay decent money for it. They are transposed into GOSTs, GOSTI, ISO, and on this basis, based on the presence of all these things, this block system, this equipment of iron, it falls into standards. And based on these standards, orders for equipping schools are formed. All this is purchased with money, budget, one way or another. It ends up in schools. And all these devices, devices end up, first they end up with children, then teachers and parents get involved in this story. And thus, through several steps, we find ourselves in this web of interconnected processes, stakeholders, and educational infrastructure. When it comes to implementing hardware and software through standards, which undergo a three-step process, we ultimately arrive at the formation of a digital behavior stereotype from childhood, that is, the development of consistent patterns of behavior in the digital realm that are ingrained in us from an early age. At present, when it comes to the age threshold for children being included in digital educational systems, there is a gradual decrease. This is happening under the pressure of lobbyists and digitalization enthusiasts. Anyway, there are such individuals who advocate for this change. Under their influence, the age limit is being lowered, accommodating more children in digital learning platforms. From an early age, they begin developing what is known as a digital model and a behavior stereotype. In general, they rapidly mature in this ecosystem of digitization, as it is pervasive and readily available to everyone in their homes, pockets and schools, where they naturally find themselves, firmly believing they are an integral part of this well-established environment digital educational environment. And the devices themselves, of course, perceive it as a regular environment, like we put the interior there and so on, just like in a physical setting. And also, of course, they are engaged in management and participation and in providing feedback. Once again, I want to emphasize the question of feedback, the question of reverse biological connection and reverse reaction connection, which are solved in completely different ways, different questions. That is, the issue can be resolved by transmitting certain signals, such as color, sound, markers, and font signals, which are embedded in the design and algorithm of the programs. It is crucial to emphasize that these programs have an educational focus and aim to provide effective solutions. Once again, I will persistently with the persistence of an idiot, remind you that the main basic principles, the basic principles for designing these programs, come from standards that have gone through a three-step process and have come here to us. So the ideology of these guys, which is laid down precisely by these guys sitting in Massachusetts at Stanford and reporting to the National Academy of Sciences of the USA through Venderoff, with the support of the US Army, which is officially known, officially known, they don't hide it. These algorithms go through a three-step process to become standards, which are then used by children who first receive a digital educational environment as an experiment in our country, and then receive it totally. All aspects related to organ vision, nervous system, musculoskeletal disorders, and imbalance with weight and muscle mass are covered in this system. 
they usually receive the necessary information, that is, the details they need to understand and address these issues effectively. It is extremely challenging to find children who are practically healthy, who come in and who go out, as it is a task that is very hard to accomplish. The statistics we have gathered on this occasion clearly demonstrate that during this period of digitization, virtually all groups of nosological diseases have witnessed a remarkable and unprecedented surge in numbers and prevalence. Acquiring 5 and 6G, that is the setup that wraps up the entire biological feedback system, you know? It's a crucial element in understanding and analyzing the complex workings of this system. The process of transmitting a signal and receiving a person's response, which can include a person's response on a physiological level, for instance, through the delivery of information and the subsequent reception of feedback, plays a vital role in communication and understanding between individuals at a level he doesn't even realize yet. Yeah, we get it, we understand that we have one thing, like we're aware of it, and another thing, besides our body still functions, we still don't realize a lot of things. The 5G system, and particularly 6G, which incorporates a system of reverse biological feedback, smart implants, and all that jazz, it is all built into this standard that serves as the foundation for these advanced technologies. This wraps up the system, wraps up this configuration, makes it comprehensive, complete, and allows you to purposefully direct signals to those groups, receive a response, adjust it, manage it, etc. So like this here is just one of those cases where they're told to go left, but they go right because they got a signal. He. Externally, you get it for yourself. Once again, you feel like you made the decision yourself. You think you made the decision yourself, but it's already a big, really big deal. We don't know where the decisions come from. We don't know where the decisions come from. Here you receive, you have individuals with you who assist you in making a decision and you perceive it in a physiological way very well. So, like recently, we have been concluding a significant portion of our discussions with the subject of bioethics and the necessity to establish bioethical committees, both at the national level and internationally, that would oversee the broader subject of technology advancement, what is permissible, what is not, what is allowed, what is not, and what contradicts certain humanistic principles regarding human civilization. Oleg, thanks for the talk. With us was Oleg Grigoriev, a doctor of biological sciences and the chairman of the Russian Committee for Protection from Radiation.